the ATF is on some nonsense again about pistol braces and I have tried to consume as much information as possible and while I am not a lawyer, I don't know anything actually, I'm, I'm just a random guy on the internet, I've seen a lot of misinformation so let's try to just talk about the major takeaways from this thing. So first off, everything's an SBR, basically. Um, things that used to be considered braced pistols are now almost always going to be considered SPRs. With that comes all of the NFA implications, but the way that they're doing this, um, they're doing away with the original proposal, which was that $49.99 like, score sheet. They're not doing that anymore. That's, that's dead. That's done. They give a lot of examples of things that a week ago, all of us would have been perfectly happy calling braced pistols, and all of them are SPRs. This includes everything from, obviously, ARs, AKs, PCCs, Glock, the Roni conversions, everything that had been adapted to take a brace now seems like it's going to be an SBR. I wasn't able to find a single example in the hundreds and hundreds of pages that actually showed a brace pistol where they did not say, yes, this is an SBR. All of them were bad now. There's apparently no room for nuance or anything. Uh, they're, they're just all stocks now. So in actuality, what they're doing now is looking at weight, length, length of pull, whether those three are comparable to a similarly set up SBR, which is basically everything. Um, they're looking at whether you've got a, you know, a scope on it that requires it to kind of be up close by your face. They're also indicating that any surface area on the rear of the pistol that is not absolutely necessary for the function of the pistol is problematic. They're looking at marketing, whether it's direct marketing from the manufacturer, which they've been playing dancing games for years. They're also looking at not only direct marketing, but also secondary marketing and just general usage in the community. So they leave themselves enough room that if anybody ever uses it as a stock ever, then it must be a stock. So basically their position going forward is we'll know it when we see it and we'll always see it. I like to think that their new rules could basically be boiled down to if it's ever confused the most boomer fud guy that you know when he's like is that a stock and then yeah in their minds yes it, it is now a stock they give themselves the maximum amount of leeway to screw you over so like i said everything is an sbr now apparently with that being said they do give us some options as you can see here most of them are either destroy it get rid of it throw it away turn it into the atf or convert it to a rifle either by swapping uppers or pin and welding a barrel extension or you can jump through all of the hoops that are required in order to join the nfa game with all of your applications submitted within the 120 day grace period that they are so generously allowing us they are waiving the 200 or i'm sorry they are forbearing the $200 tax stamp, which I'm not going to get into the questionable legality of that whole effort, but we'll see how that plays out. But if you do choose to go through those hoops and register it as an SBR, they say currently, as of now, that you can actually just remove the brace and put a real stock on there because their, their kind of position is that it's always been an SBR. So like once it's in it, once it's truly an SBR, then it, it won't matter, which is good. I've seen some guys say that you have to keep the brace, which is kind of ridiculous. And I think that's just fear mongering. Um, but that, that's not what they're saying. But even though they're saying that these have always been SBRs, you can't go ahead and put a stock on it now until after you get your Form 1. They're, they're definitely playing both sides of that, but that's, that's what they're saying. Also, supposedly, you're going to have to prove that it currently is set up with a brace. Once it's published, that's supposed to be the cutoff date, and you're not, you can't just go out and buy a dozen lower so that you can have a dozen SBRs, even though I'm sure someone is going to do that. <laughs> also, because their position is these have magically always been SBRs, now you can't transfer them unless you do a Form 4. So unless it's already on a trust, you can't file for your free tax stamp to put your new SBR on the trust. Like you have to do it as an individual because you as the individual own the brace pistol, not the trust, which is super annoying to people like me who have a trust set up for my NFA stuff. Like I wanted everything to be in the, the same bucket and that's the whole reason I got the trust. I understand their logic in its own twisted sense, but it's just super annoying. And lastly, for compliance takeaways, estimates range a lot from like seven to 40 million of these out there. But even if only 10% bother to register their newfound SBRs, that's gonna massively add to the current log jam that is the NFA process. Wait times even for eForm 4s are already almost a year. This is gonna push everything over a year, almost certainly. We're all just gonna be stuck in this purgatory for kind of ever. Now, I know there has definitely been a thread of resistance. Uh, there's a lot of guys that are like, shall not comply and shall not be infringed. And I, I get that, I understand that, I totally sympathize. But if you've had a brace this whole time, you've, you've been complying. You know, free men don't ask, but the only true free men in this country are the, 
the guys flashing smiles on Instagram um, because they don't care and they don't ask and they don't care how public they are. You can't say free men don't ask to, to do the thing quietly in the closet in the dark and please don't ask. Uh, like that's you're still asking for permission. So so I think those people are more talk than they are by as per usual the internet just being boisterous for the sake of it. So like I said, do what you want. I'm gonna wait and see what happens to see how this thing plays out in courts first before I choose what I'm gonna do. But even if you choose just to take your braces off, the ATF is still leaving themselves plenty of room for constructive intent. So you'll basically have to take them off, throw them away, and probably swap to a pistol buffer tube because surface area on the back of a carbine buffer tube, it's got that extra little quarter of an inch of surface area. I would absolutely not be surprised if they still tried to jam you up for that especially if their ire were pointed at you for something else, like they're gonna throw that at the wall and see if it sticks. So, so things to keep in mind if you, should you choose to go the shall not comply route. So Scorpion here, this is definitely a problem for them. So if I choose to go the shall not comply route, I will have to keep it like this. This I will have to completely throw away or, or get rid of or destroy. At least that is how I am reading it. Otherwise, if I do comply, I can file for everything, wait an ungodly amount of time before I finally get my Form 1 on the individual instead of on my trust, and then I can throw this thing away and get the factory stock and put it on there. I'm sympathetic to the, the guys that are already in the NFA game. You know, I have a suppressor. They have my fingerprints. They have my information. They have everything already. I'm sympathetic to the idea of I was going to SBR this anyway, so why not get that rolling and save $200? But I also completely understand the, you know, frick the government and F those guys. I get both sides. Like I said, I'm going to see how it plays out in court first, but we'll see. So now that we've talked about takeaways, whether you comply or you don't, let's talk about implications. So there's a few things. First off, there's implications for folks who don't live in a free state where they can have SBRs. Um, those guys are just kind of screwed especially if they also have an accompanying assault weapons ban. Of course, then there's interstate travel. You know, people who aren't already in the NFA game may not realize, but you can't just travel across state lines with SBRs without getting permission from the king first. There's also going to be a lot of unintentional felons. There's a lot of guys who just walked into their local pawn shop and were like, oh, cool, that looks cool. It's short, it's compact, it looks fun. And they bought it and they took it home and they shoot it once a year and they have never heard of the NFA. They think it's got a stock on it already. They have no idea. They're never going to hear about this rule change. And they are just going to have this thing in perpetuity. And one of those poor guys is going to get caught up in something else. And he's going to get absolutely railed for that thing. <laughs> and I feel sorry for that guy. But that's why bureaucrats should not be able to make laws. And the flip side of that guy is even if it's Joe Blow who has one AR pistol and he hears about this rule change, the barrier to entry for jumping into the NFA game is super high and that's a feature not a bug also you know uh, you got to do fingerprints you got to do photos you got to do an application you got to keep up with the interstate travel issues you got to make sure the possession stays only within your control you can't just lend it to your buddy like there's so many rules and so much that goes along with it and so much baggage compared to you purchasing and owning a quote-unquote normal rifle or pistol so like there's tons of implications around all this that are going to massively complicate a ton of people's lives and should they get caught up for anything those guys are going to be absolutely railed because let's keep in mind here the penalties of ten thousand dollars i think and or 10 years in jail for not paying a 200 dollars tax that is fundamentally the issue here it's a tax it's not about registration it's not about control it's always fundamentally been about the tax that's how it was originally enacted. That's why there's questionable legality about them being able to waive the tax part because that's always been the core of this. It's a tax stamp. It's a tax. That's the key issue. <sighs> okay, I'm done ranting about this. Ideally, this will be killed in court. And I hope, I can only hope, that it will take down a part of the NFA with it and we can just have short barrel rifles and be done with it. Um, because I think 40 million is pretty common use, but... I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a judge, I'm not a fed, so I don't think like a lizard person, so that is almost certainly not going to happen. However, there's something to the accelerationist idea that as we wildly swing from one extreme of legality to another, that something eventually will have to be done legislatively so that we can just put this whole thing to bed and be done with it. Because the fact that SBRs are illegal is this weird byproduct of the original NFA wanting to ban pistols. Like, it's not even 
it's not even a public safety issue. They say, oh, it's because these are dangerous and unusual, but there's 40 million of them. And also there's been no noticeable uptick in crime in the decade plus that they've been legal and wildly popular. This whole thing has to break eventually, I would hope. Sometime this century, preferably this decade. So, I don't know. That's my thoughts and takeaways as far as this whole situation. It's a giant mess and do let me know if I got anything wrong because I don't want to contribute to more inf misinformation of what's floating around out there and what's actually going to happen. Of course, the whole thing is fluid and hopefully it radically changes in the very near future and I get to take this video down. But as of now, I believe that's where we stand. So do what you feel like you got to do. I won't say hopefully you enjoyed this video because this is incredibly stupid, but uh, hopefully you learned something today and uh, I'll see you next time.